There we go. These first announcements are just going to be me repeating myself, which is okay. So if anybody comes in on time and they miss this announcement, hopefully they'll be okay. Once again, the exam is on Monday at 8 a.m. online. Um, if you miss it, you just get a zero. I know previously. Morning. I was a little nervous. I thought that the exam was today. I don't have to figure I came over again. You were good. It's funny you should mention that because that's what I was announcing. For reminding everybody. Yeah, that the I exam. You're good. The exam is Monday at 8 a.m. online. If you're late, I mean, just jump in and start it. Because actually, if you're late, if you're late, let me know. I'm going to be online, right? I'll be online. You don't have to be. If you, for some reason something happens, and like the computer is really slow to boot up, you start a little bit late. That's okay. Let me know. We'll make arrangements. But if you if you email me later in the day, later, oh, I forgot it was today, or I could, I forgot I slept in. Like you guys are adults, so you know, I've been giving leniency a little bit, even though their grade did suffer if they were late. This time it's a straight up zero if you missed the exam. The exam is Monday, 8 a.m. online. I've seen it a thousand times, and I'm putting it in writing a lot. I've done it already, yeah, yeah. so I don't want any excuses. Um, also about the exam. Segue into this, you know, today's the last day of class, so it's pretty much too late to fix your, like, do crazy extra stuff to fix your grade. So, you know, don't waste, save your time and mine, and don't email me and say, what can I do to fix my grade? Here's the answer. Fix whatever you've missed. So look at your grade sheet, you know, go back and find, like, your lowest uh, labs and fix those, or if you don't know, a bit more important, if you're missing assignments, fix those. My biggest suggestion is this. If you're looking at your grades and trying to fix it over the weekend, because Sunday is the last day you can do anything. Um, remember that you have a final coming up. So I would focus on like, again, look at your grade sheet and look at the your absences, right? So if you have absences, go back and watch those videos. Because not only would that help the grade, but that'll help you prepare for the final. And the other thing you should do to help prepare for the final that'll also help your independent work grade is do those study guides, right? And I would focus on that. And then um, I would also focus on writing independent work. Because after Sunday, it's done, all bets are off. There might be a few things I throw out at you guys over the week, next week, even though we'll be officially done. I might say, hey, if you watch this video, I might give you some points. If you watch that video, I might give you some points. But I'm definitely done grading written work. So this is the weekend to do it. Any questions? All right. Sorry for you guys online from last time. Um, I couldn't hear you. I'm looking at it right now, and it seems to me that I am projecting, and then you can see things normally. So hopefully that is the case. And let's get started. Uh, before we start, the yes. exam three, is that retake ever? Can yes. You know yeah. Everything's. Oh, so the question, in case you didn't hear it online, was is it too late to retake exam three? And yes, it is. The reason being is because now any of you can come and meet me online and discuss exam three. So if we talk about exam three and I talk exactly, tell you why you missed these questions and what was wrong with them, then remember, you get a 5% boost to your grade for that, for all the exams. We can do that today? Yeah, okay. as long as we can find a time to schedule it, yes. And also, we can do that next week. So that's one of those few things that I'll do next week. I won't grade written work, but I will meet with you and talk about old exams and old labs and so we can talk about why you missed it. So it doesn't have to be today. Right, okay. yeah. Because I'm trying to teach you. Right, so I want you to learn biology. So um, I want to talk to you about the questions you missed, so you can understand why you missed it. It's very important to me. So yeah, great question. Too late to do re uh, too late to retake exams, but the reason being is because now we can talk about it. Because if I talk to you about exam three, then I run the risk. I'm just going to say you because that makes it sound like you're shady. Technically, if I talk to one student about exam three and say, all right, this is why these are all the right answers, then they can technically go to the other student and say, here's all the right answers, and then they can go retake the exam, and it would be fair. Anyway, let's jump back into chapter 20. Let's hope we can finish it, uh, because today's the last lecture. If we don't finish it, you know, I'll try to make sure that the final reflects that. You don't have any questions about material we didn't cover. But regardless, even if I don't finish teaching you this stuff, finish reading chapter 20. And if you have any questions about it, let me know. So we finished talking about this, right? We were talking about a food chain, and then we said, oh, food chain's not very, no, excuse me, we're way past that. We were talking about 
um, energy flow, energy and chemical flows through um, the trophic structure. So we were talking about how you know you, you only get 10% of energy as you move up the trophic levels. That's what we ended up. Now we're talking about species diversities and community. Oh, excuse me. I'm way down. Woo! It's the pyramid that threw me off. That's where we are. Yeah, here we are. This is where we left off. We were talking about, again, like I said, the fact that every time you move up a trophic level in the, um, the pyramid, you're losing 90% of the energy. Only 10% of the energy makes it from one level to the next. That's how it works in the wild. And then we segue into this, which is talking about how we're going to talk about ecosystem energetics and human resource use. So basically, everything we just talked about is the way things are in the wild, and now we're going to apply it to humans. The concepts are the same, so I'm going to go through it pretty quickly. This is basically what this first bullet point says. Uh, the dynamics of energy flow apply to humans as much as other organisms. So basically everything I taught you also applies to humans. Uh, the first word for attendance, and I'm going to do the same normal thing that I usually do is for those of you in person, if you want to email me the attendance words for a little bit of extra credit, you can. But humans is the first word for attendance. So I'm going to give you two different production pyramids, which is the one basically that we saw earlier, right, with the uh, producers at the bottom then the primary consumers and the secondary consumers and all that. We're going to show you one of those on the next slide, except this is going to be used in the context of humans. So it should look familiar. So now it's a little bit different because we're just looking at humans. So here, and this is just all you know, hypothetical, we're looking at the producers, in this case it's corn. Then we look at the primary consumers, and humans are interesting in that way because sometimes we are the primary consumers, right, because we're omnivores. So when we're eating um, when we're eating plants, we are the primary consumer. When we're eating meat, we are the secondary consumer. Um, obviously, we usually do both, depending on the person. For me, almost every meal, I'm both the primary consumer and the secondary consumer. Basically, all this slide is showing you, and this is the important concept, especially if you take Bio 108 with me. Point here is that vegetarians are basically better for the environment than meat eaters. And I don't know if I say that without judgment, because I am a meat eater. I try to limit it for health reasons and for environmental reasons. but it just takes a lot less land to feed vegetarians, right? And I know this is just a graphic, but remember, every time we go from one step to the next, just like in nature, it's only 10%. So if there's a, thou a thousand kilocalories here, let's just keep it simple, say 100 kilocalories. If there's 100 kilocalories worth of corn, then by the time humans eat it, then it's uh, one kilocalorie, right? So every time you go up, it's only 10%, which is why, I don't know, let's say that's 100, 100 acres worth of uh, plants, it can feed that many people, right? But if you have 100 acres worth of plants that are then feeding the cows, then 100 acres worth of the plants only uh, feeds one person. Of course, those numbers aren't exact, but the idea here is, again, if you're eating meat, it requires much more land for you to eat. Um, and that should go back to think about the ecological footprint um, calculator that you did. That's why they ask, you know, how much meat do you eat? Because when you eat more meat, they're required to land. Anyway, any questions about that slide? All right. So to remind you what we just finished talking about, is I hate the timing of it because we just finished the tail end of energy flow and ecosystems, right? We just finished talking about energy flow. And we spent a good bit of the last lecture talking about that. So it just sucks that we just, just now finished it. But anyway, now we're jumping into chemical cycling because remember, what we said before we started these two little bullet points, right? So the intro to this bullet point said, and this is very important, so I'll remind you it'll be in the exam, should be in the exam. Energy flows through ecosystems and matter slash chemical, chemicals are recycled. So that being said, like I said, we just finished talking about how energy flows through ecosystems. Now we're going to talk about the idea of how things are recycled, how matter and chemicals are recycled. Before we talk about that, as usual, your book gives you a little introduction to talk about why it's important, why this is relevant, why you're learning about it. Well, obviously, life depends on recycling of chemicals. That's why you're learning about it. As, as boring as it may be to you, you know, without it, we just wouldn't have life. Um, when organisms are alive, the chemical stock changes continuously as nutrients are required and waste products are released. So basically, you know, like let's say you weigh, or let's say I weigh. 250 pounds, and it doesn't vary that much, right? But even though my overall mass doesn't vary much, 
my chemical stock does, right? I am taking in a lot of stuff. I'm also putting out a lot of stuff, right? So the exact molecules in my body do change a lot while I'm alive. Um, and then when you die, right, atoms in an organism at death are returned to the environment by decomposers and replenishing inorganic nutrients that uh, producers use to build new organic matter. So when you think about this one, it's probably best to think about things other than humans. But generally, humans are weird, right? Because we like to be put in caskets, so when we decompose, we're just sitting there in a box. Or, you know, sometimes there's a cremation. But generally speaking, it might be better to think about this in context of non-humans, right? So the squirrels on WBSU's campus, right? When they eat stuff, you know, they're constantly switching their chemicals. But when they die, they decompose wherever it is that they die, and their nutrients go back to the soil, and then plants grow. And their chemicals that were in their body are now still alive or still around on Earth. They're just in a different form because they're in a plane. So anyway, that's just an introduction. There's no questions about that on the exam. But are there any questions about this introductory slide? This next picture I'm going to show you is a great example of what I'm talking about. So I don't know if you can tell what it is. But here we have a tree that's fallen down. It's dead. But it's required all those chemicals throughout its life as it goes through photosynthesis. Um, but even though it's dead, that matter is still there and it's still being put to use. So we've got this tree growing on top of it. And there's things under that that's helping decompose that dead tree and putting those nutrients into the alive tree. And the circle of life continues. So here we go. Before we talk about some specific chemical cycles, specifically we're going to talk about carbon, phosphorus, and nitrogen. Obviously, there's a lot of other ones, but these are the big ones. These are the most important ones. So before we talk specifically about carbon, how carbon goes from living things to non-living things, and how phosphorus does that, we're going to talk about, in general, how things go from living things to non-living things. So that's basically what we're talking about here. This whole chemical cycling in ecosystems, if you want to think about it this way, we are going to be talking about the circle of life, right? Living things bring in chemicals, right? Molecules, matter, however you want to say it. And then when they die, they were punished back into the environment. The circle continues. All right. Basically, what I just said is what your book said. And your book says it this way. Chemical cycles involve biotic and abiotic components. They are called biogeochemical cycles. So basically, what you need to know is that biogeochemical cycles cycle between the biotic and abiotic. Right? So we know, for example, that there's a lot of carbon in our bodies, right? So we have a lot of carbon in us, for example, and that is in the that's in the biotic, right? And then when we breathe it out, when we breathe out carbon dioxide, it is then into the atmosphere, which means it is abiotic. And then a plant brings it in, right? In the Calvin cycle of photosynthesis. And then it comes back to the biotic because that is then part of the plant, right? And then we eat it, and it's still part of the biotic cycle. And then again, you breathe out, and then it goes back to the abiotic. Anyway, we'll talk about that specifically. The idea here is that what I really want you to know is when we're talking about the biogeochemical cycles, the cycle that we're talking about is going from living to non-living, living to non-living. So there's a few cycles we've been talking about, right? So way back when, for example, we talked about the ATP cycle, which is when you went from ADP to ATP to ADP to ATP. This one's pretty much that simple. Living to non-living. And all this, basically, that I've already underlined in red, is what these bullet points say. Right? We have a biotic reservoir, which are the living organisms, and a biotic reservoir, which are the non-living. And I doubt I'll ever give you a question this easy, but, for, but I'll ask you now to see if uh, anybody knows. If we're talking about phosphorus, and I say, all right, there's a phosphorus in that fern plant, would that be biotic reservoir or abiotic? Some phosphorus in a fern plant. Let's say I can see a fern plant. It would be biotic. Biotic, right? good. Now what if I say there's phosphorus in the rocks, in the Canal State Forest? In the rocks. Focus on that part, not the Canal State Forest. Uh, abiotic. Abiotic, right? So living and not living. It's that simple. So try not to overthink it for the exam. So I'm going to mostly skip over this. Because this kind of shows the cycle, but it, it's a little, in some ways it's confusing. But try to think about what I was saying. Um, so if we're talking about, again, I don't know, carbon, right? So there's carbon in the, in the atmosphere. That's an abiotic reservoir. And then um, 
plants bring it in and the Calvin cycle to make glucose, right? That's what that's what this would be, at which point it is in a producer, right? That is in, it's in the biotic reservoir at that point. It's in the plant. And then something eats it, right? So then the carbon is in whatever it's eating it. It's still in the biotic reservoir though, right? Because the producer and the consumers are all biotic. And then the consumer, maybe if it's carbon, I'm just using carbon as an example, if it breathes it out, then you know it goes into the abiotic reservoir. But again, there's no need to study this one, because this is just a general scheme for each one, for carbon, phosphorus, and nitrogen, we're going to look at the cycle, and you're going to need to know the cycle, but it won't be this general. We're going to look specifically at those three different um, cycles. So the next word for attendance is going to have nothing to do with what we're talking about, the little we show. Like a television show. Or show me the money. Or Missouri, the show me state. All right, so again, we're going to talk specifically about the carbon cycle, the phosphorus cycle, and the nitrogen cycle. There's no need to write those down because we're going to talk about them separately. So here we go. First one we're going to talk about is the carbon cycle, which is really good because, in a sense, for non biology majors, this is probably one of the more, well, they're all pretty relevant to your everyday life. But the good thing about the carbon cycle is we've already kind of talked about it. When we talked about photosynthesis and respiration, we talked about this. So this is, should be a review. Carbon has a, an atmospheric reservoir and it cycles globally. Those are the most important things you need to know. So there's going to be, for those of you who have done study guides, are, you already know this. But some of the big questions about these different things are going to be, what is the major abiotic reservoir for carbon? What is the major abiotic reservoir for phosphorus? What is the major abiotic reservoir for nitrogen? So eventually I'm going to show you a picture that shows all the abiotic and all the biotic reservoirs. But on the, on the slideshow, I'm going to give you the major ones, the big ones. And for the exam, that's what you need to know. So carbon, it's mostly, you should think of carbon as the abiotic, or the atmosphere as the abiotic reservoir. Um, also, other abiotic reservoirs for carbon include fossil fuels, right? Because those are hydrocarbons. That's why when we burn fossil fuels, it releases carbon dioxide into the air, which when you have too much of it, which we do, it is a bad thing. And what's that after you said carbon? Carbon, yeah. Okay. Yep. This is all about carbon for now. And of course, there's also some car uh, dissolved carbon compounds in the ocean. To be safe for carbon, if you're taking notes and studying for the final, I would remember all of these things oceans, right? So again, there's many carbon reservoirs. Basically, any plant, anything that has carbon in it that's not alive, that is an abiotic reservoir for carbon, right? So you can imagine there's a lot of carbon reservoirs. Um, but the big ones are, again, atmosphere, fossil fuels, and oceans. So that's the new information. What you already know from photosynthesis and respiration is this one right here. Carbon cycles between the biotic and abiotic, mainly by photosynthesis, which takes carbon out of the biotic, right, or out of the abiotic, right, out of the reservoir, and puts it into the biotic, which would be the plant, right? So we know plants take in carbon dioxide and photosynthesis, specifically the Calvin cycle. I keep repeating that because on the final, you'll probably get that question, right? Calvin cycle takes in the carbon dioxide, incorporates it into G3P, which is then turned into glucose or other um, molecules in the plants, and then you know, the byproduct of that is oxygen, right? Because, you know, the, the water is giving up electrons, and then that turns it into oxygen. So plants give off oxygen as they do photosynthesis, and then the oxygen's in the, um, in the, in the atmosphere. Humans breathe it in, breathe out carbon dioxide. You guys already know that. Anyway, are there any questions about the carbon cycle? All right. If you download this PowerPoint, you can watch this little video, this little animation that talks about the carbon cycle. Here's a little picture that shows everything we're talking about. It's a little bit more complicated than what you've seen before, but if you're studying the, the slide I showed you before, there's enough information you can just study that, right? This gets pretty complicated, but again, what is the abiotic reservoir? The main, what are the major abiotic reservoirs for uh, carbon? The atmosphere, that's the big one, right? We also talked about fossil fuels, um, and then what you can't see here is um, carbon dioxide dissolved in the ocean. But again, you can see how, right, it's in the atmosphere, mostly, 
whether it's from burning fossil fuels or whatever, and then it's brought into the body by photosynthesis, right? Photosynthesis takes it out of the atmosphere and brings it into the biotic realm, at which point, you know, things eat it. Or maybe that plant just dies, excuse me, and things don't eat it, right? So we just came, we just went through fall, all the, tree, all the leaves fell, they're gonna decompose, and then again, the carbon's gonna be released, so on and so forth. Any questions about that? Pretty simple stuff. The next thing we're going to talk about is the phosphorus cycle. Um, and what you need to know for the exam is this right here. The phosphorus cycle has no atmospheric component. So when you're breathing in and out, you know, there is no phosphorus in the air. So what you need to know for the exam, more importantly, is this second bullet point. Rocks are the only source, I don't even like that. This came directly from your book. Let me change this. Rocks are the main source for terrestrial ecosystems. I don't like the, I don't know why they would say the only, because later on we're gonna talk about phosphorus pollution. We're gonna talk about how humans are putting too much phosphorus in ecosystems. Obviously, humans are not rocks. Some of us rock more than others. Robert Plant, for example. But we ourselves are not rocks, right? So anyway, what you need to know for the exam right there, that's that bullet point right there. Rocks are the main component for, for phosphorus. So if you're taking shorthand notes, rocks, abiotic, uh, phosphorus, right? That's where we're getting from. So any questions about that? We're still going to talk a little bit more about it, but are there any questions about it? All right, your book also points some stuff out. I'm not gonna ask you anything on this slide, but it's still good to know. The phosphates move from land to water faster than they are replaced. In nature, anyway, there'll be some exceptions. We'll talk about that later. But what we're saying here is like, we're, we're talking about there's phosphates on land, there's phosphates on water. And in nature, phosphates are going into water quicker than they're like being replaced on land. So because of that, soil characteristics may also decrease the amount of phosphate available to plants. Um, and as a result, phosphate is a limiting factor in many terrestrial ecosystems, which is why um, fertilizers are usually good. That's why we use fertilizers, right? Because when we're trying to grow stuff, there's plenty of carbon in the atmosphere, so it's not like we need to figure out a way to give them extra carbon dioxide. Usually when you're trying to grow something and you use fertilizers, you're looking for phosphates because phosphates are a limiting factor. Have we talked about, I think we've talked about a limiting factor. But just in case we haven't, I'll give you an example. If you have a, if you're a bakery, right, and the only thing you make is chocolate chip cookies, and you just have semi-loads of all the ingredients coming every day, you have plenty of all the ingredients. And the only ingredient you don't have, you get like, every week, you get a five gallon drum of chocolate chips, right? So you got, just tons and tons of all the other ingredients, but you barely have any chocolate chips. Chocolate chips would be your limiting factor, right? You, you, if it wasn't for the chocolate chip, you'd be churning out chocolate chip cookies, but those are your limiting factors. And then plants, phosphate is the limiting factor a lot. So they've got all the other stuff they need, plenty of the other stuff, especially carbon, um, but one of, the, one of the few things that they don't have is the phosphate. And again, I'll put a big X to this. I know I'm talking about it a lot, considering it's not gonna be on the exam, but it is good to know. Any questions about that side? All right. There's a picture of the phosphorus cycle. So again, and you don't need to study this, but what you should know for this, for the exam, is the main component of phosphorus is rock, right? So you've got a lot of phosphorus, a lot of phosphates in that rock. And as rain hits it and it gets weathered, you know, it gets eroded, and then the phosphorus comes off land into the water. You know, it shows it here in the pond, but eventually, right, it makes its way to the oceans. Obviously, that's happening quicker than phosphor than rock is being made. So that's what we mean by uh, the phosphates are leaving quicker than they're replaced. Not that I'll ask you that on the exam. Again, for the exam, you need to know the major abiotic reservoir for phosphorus are the rocks. But really quickly, even though I won't ask you this, so we know since the carbon was an atmospheric component. We also knew the way it mainly got out of the atmosphere was photosynthesis. Well, here, it's sort of the same, except it's not photosynthesis, but it's still plants. It's still plants taking the phosphorus out of the abiotic reservoir and assimilating it into their own 
you know, into their own plant body. So at that point, it is then into the biotic reservoir, where it's eaten by animals, where it's still a uh, biotic reservoir, where then it's pooped, you know, and then goes back into the soil, and it's still in a biotic reservoir, so on and so forth. Any questions about that? <clears throat> All right. The last cycle we're going to talk about is the nitrogen cycle. Nitrogen has two major abiotic reservoirs, and again, you need to know this for the exam, the atmosphere and the soil. Put a question mark next to this number because I'm not sure I'm going to ask you that. But yeah, so most of the nitrogen that you find in non-living things will be found in the atmosphere and the soil. Specifically, there's so much nitrogen in the air that it's 80%. So, you know, everyone likes to say you're breathing in oxygen and breathing out carbon dioxide. Really, what you're breathing in is mostly nitrogen, and you're breathing out mostly nitrogen, right? But still, we say that because we want you to focus on the fact that you're breathing in for the sake of getting oxygen, and you're breathing out for the sake of getting, car getting rid of carbon dioxide. But yeah, the atmosphere is 80% nitrogen gas. However, plants can't just take nitrogen gas out of the atmosphere like they can't carbon dioxide. Be a lot cooler if they could, in a way. Right? So they again, plants cannot use nitrogen gas. I'm not sure if I'll ask you that or not. But that brings us to a new term that you do need to know, which is nitrogen fixation. So because again, unlike carbon dioxide, plants just can't take nitrogen gas out of the atmosphere. So the nitrogen gas that's in the atmosphere needs to be fixed. And that's what nitrogen fixation is. It converts basically, there's a lot of information there after that word nitrogen fixation. But what you need to know for the exam is nitrogen fixation is taking nitrogen gas and turning it into another form that plants can use. Yes, technically nitrogen gas is into, and yes, technically the other form that the plants can use is called ammonia, which is also known as NH3. Now I'm not going to ask you that much detail. What you need to know is nitrogen fixation takes nitrogen gas, which can't, plants can't use, they convert it to a form that plants can't use. I'm not even going to ask you what that form is. Then it gets even more complicated. I'm sure they're not going to ask you this, but that ammonia, that NH3, it then goes through a different chemical change. It gains a proton, and then it becomes something called ammonium, which is NH4+, and that's what plants can use, right? So it's a complicated situation. We've got nitrogen gas. That gets converted to ammonia. That gets converted to ammonium. And then finally, plants can use it. But again, for the exam, you don't need to know that. You just need to know it goes, whoop, it goes from the gas, which plants can't use, to a form that they can't use, but that they can use. Are there any questions about this slide? All right. Most nitrogen comes from biological fixation, performed by two types of nitrogen fixing bacteria. Um, I'll put a big X to this too. It's a 100 level course. And I'm limited on to what, you know, how many questions I can ask you on the exam, so I'm not going to ask you anything from this. But yeah, most of it comes from two different types of nitrogen-fixing bacteria. Some of them live, live symbiotically. We talked about that when I first gave you the word symbiosis, right? When I first mentioned that, I said you need to know that. Um, anyway, some of them live in the roots of plants, like we already mentioned, and that supplies the host with usable nitrogen. And then some of them are free-living bacteria. But either way, they're still taking carbon out of the, or excuse me, nitrogen out of the atmosphere and changing it to a form that um, plants can use. Are there any questions about that? All right, here's a picture of everything we talked about. Again, when you're studying, I wouldn't necessarily study this picture because it has a lot of details that I'm not necessarily going to ask you about. Another thing I didn't even mention, because as far as we're concerned for a 100 level biology course, um, we did talk about the opposite. So we talked about nitrogen fixation, which is taking the nitrogen gas out of the atmosphere and changing it to a form that plants can use. The opposite of that is denitrifying, right? So there's also bacteria that do, do the opposite. They take the nitrogen that plants can use, right, and they turn it into nitrogen gas, and then it goes back into the atmosphere. There might be questions on the study guide about this. I don't remember it's about denitrifying, but there you go. Definitely won't be any questions about it on the exam. The next word for attendance is that thing right there. Cabbage. Any questions about this slide? 
points out too that humans have disrupted the nitrogen cycle because we are adding more nitrogen to the ecosystems than natural processes do. And the two major sources of that, and I'm going to put a question mark because I'm not sure if I'm going to ask you this or not. It all depends on how many questions I have. I can prioritize the questions. The two major sources of nitrogen are burning fossil fuels. So, for example, John Amos, right, when we burn coal, it releases nitrogen into the atmosphere. That's a whole different discussion because then they have things called scrubbers that get most of it out. But we don't have time to talk about that. And that's a pretty different course anyway. And then agricultural practices, specifically fertilizer. So what I didn't say earlier, or I did say earlier, but your book didn't mention it earlier, was, you know, we said phosphorus is a major limiting factor. So is nitrogen. It's a major limiting factor. So when we put down fertilizers, it's mostly phosphorus and nitrogen. And if any of you have dealt with fertilizer, you'll notice there's like a ratio. There's a number that's ratio, and that's what the ratio is. How much phosphorus, how much nitrogen. Um, anyway, I'll put it next to the second bullet point. Not because it's not important, I'm just definitely not going to ask you. But when we're talking about um, the combustion of fossil fuels, that's where we get this. Some of the nitrogen escapes to the atmosphere, and that forms nitrous oxide, and nitrous oxide contributes to global warming. So that's why it's a bad thing. Also, acid rain and things like that, that we don't talk about in this course. Anyway, are there any questions about this slide? So this slide is a great segue to the next slide the next topic, which is nutrient pollution. And off the top of my head, I think everybody did the last lab, which is one of the few ones that everyone did, the one where you guys watched the video. So hopefully everybody did watch the video, in which case, everything I'm about to teach you, it's kind of like a review. You already know this if you watched and paid attention to the video about uh, you know, the poultry industry on the Chesapeake Bay and the, the Puget Sound, or more, more so Chesapeake Bay. But for example, we're going to talk about why this nutrient pollution is a bad thing. The growth of algae is limited by low nutrient levels. So algae, even though it's not technically a plant, it's still limited by its, uh, the amount of phosphorus it has and the amount of nitrogen it has. Because again, carbon dioxide, plenty of that. But it needs a lot of phosphorus, needs a lot of nitrogen, doesn't have a lot of it. Um, so what happens is humans are adding nitrogen and phosphorus to the ecosystems more than what naturally goes in. And because of that, we have things called algae blooms, as you can see there, or as you can see here. Actually, before I go forward, does anybody have any questions about this? For the exam, what you should think about, well, I'm asking you, if I have any questions about nutrient pollutions, you should think phosphorus and nitrogen. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more specifically about it. So far, for the exam, that's what you should think of. Nutrient pollution, phosphorus, and nitrogen. Any questions so far? All right, here's another picture. You can see all the algae in the water. It's kind of hard, it looks better on my screen. For those of you online, you can probably really tell how nasty and green it is, but it's just green. But it's worse than that. So, you know, when I was a kid growing up, I used to think, oh, shit, I thought those were like plants at first. Right, it looks like it, no, that's water. It's like a, a wave crash. Oh, wow. And it's just, yeah, it's, it's green. Is it meant to be like color? Huh? Is it meant to be like color? No, no, that's what's from the nitrogen, it's from the, the pollution, the nutrient pollution, so there's more algae growing than there should be. And again, like I said, or what I was starting to say when I was a child, even as I was a kid, it was a, you know, last century, literally, they were teaching us about the environment, like don't pollute, polluting's bad, littering's bad. And in my mind, I always thought the normal stuff, like it just looks horrible, right? And that's what I was thinking. Like, oh yeah, that just looks bad. But it's way more important than, oh, it just looks bad, right? It's, it's more important than that. It's actually bad for our health and bad for human existence. So, before we get into that, let's talk about where phosphor, uh, phosphate pollution comes from, even though I'm probably not going to specifically ask you this. But, as we already mentioned, a lot of it comes from agricultural fertilizers, because again, fertilizers are mostly phosphorus and nitrogen. So humans like to grow things because we like to eat, right? So, because of that, there's a lot of runoff from those farms, and that goes into the water supply. Also, as you know from the video, this bullet point right here. Phosphorus comes from the runoff of animal waste from livestock feedlots, or in the case of the video, not livestock, but poultry. Um, and then of course, obviously humans also like to make poop, and that's where that's, this bullet point here comes from, right? Our sewage treatment plants, right? So we have phosphates literally coming from our body, because you know, anything that poops, poops to put out uh, phosphates 
But of course, a little bit less known would be like dishwasher detergents and uh, laundry detergents. So it's not just the gross stuff we're putting out there, but even the clean stuff is putting out extra phosphates. Um, and phosphate pollution of lakes and rivers results in, like we already said, heavy growth of algae and something called cyanobacteria. And again, I'll put it next to that because you don't necessarily need to know that. The same can be said for nitrogen. Um, of course, the sources are a little bit different. Mostly nitrogen is coming from uh, fertilizing uh, plants, again, crops, lawns, golf courses, things like that. But as far as I'm concerned, as far as the exam is concerned, really, you should just think of these things together. When it comes to nitrogen and phosphorus, you should almost think of them as the same thing in that we're adding too much to the ecosystem. Most of it comes from us fertilizing, and most of it comes from uh, you know, uh, byproducts of agriculture. But either way, whether we're talking about phosphates or nitrogen, that's where we get to this bullet point. And again, you should be familiar with this from the video you watched in lab. The runoff, I mean, your book gets really specific. I'll even put it next to this or a line. I mean, yes, this is true. Your book is a very specific example, but really the runoff or an excess of nitrogen and phosphorus leads to something called dead zones, right? You learned about it in that video and in that context they were talking about the Chesapeake Bay, but it happens other places too. And your book is giving this specific example of the Gulf of Mexico. So you can see all the water from this area of North America, which is a big area, right? It drains into the Gulf of Mexico. So it very hills country club, when they're over fertilizing their golf course, that runs off into Davis Creek, which runs off into the Kanawha River, which runs off into the Ohio River, which runs off into the Mississippi, which eventually makes its way to the Gulf of Mexico. Right, so we're all adding to it, no matter, well, I should say no matter where you are, but even where we are, we are still adding to it. And you can see a little picture here. This is what it looks like in the winter. There's not much of it, but in the summer, all that red stuff shows the dead zones. And as you already know from the lab, and I don't have this written down, which is okay, because again, you should already know this, those dead zones come from the algae, right? So the algae, they're living, they're thriving, they're doing great. The algae's doing great, which is bad for the ecosystem. Because then, when those algae die, there's bacteria that decompose those algae. And what do those bacteria need? They need oxygen. So they suck up, basically, all the oxygen in that water. And that's why it's called a dead zone, because things just die. Any living thing that needs oxygen is going to die, because the bacteria that are decomposing the algae are taking up all the oxygen. Anyway, any questions about what a dead zone is, or phosphorus and nitrogen pollution? We might finish chapter 20 then, because now we're at our major, or the last major bullet point, which is conservation and restoration biology. So now that we know all this sciencey stuff, well, there's still a few more sciencey things that you need to learn, but we're going to talk about the rate of use. And again, I know at least one of you have had my Bio 108 course. So for you, a lot of this is going to be a review. Um, so this slide is basically just an introduction to what we're about to talk about as usual. So as usual, there's not going to be any questions about it on the exam. But many environmental problems are caused by humans. <sighs> Go figure, right? I would say most of them. Because uh, generally speaking, you know, nature has evolved to take care of itself. But we can change things up a little bit. So the ecological research, found, uh, is, ecological research is the foundation for finding solutions to these problems, which we're about to talk about and reversing negative consequences, which we're about to talk about. So any questions so far? All right, for the exam, you might need to know the difference between this, conservation biology and restoration ecology. But conservation biology is a goal-oriented science that seeks to understand and counter the loss of biodiversity. So we're talking about conservation, or we're talking about, you know, basically protecting biodiversity, whether we're talking about um, you know, preventing it from going away or bringing it back, right? Either way. So if you were shorthanding that, you could put conservation biology, um, protect biodiversity, right? Or focus on biodiversity. Restoration ecology uses ecological principles to develop methods of returning degraded area to their natural state. So in a way, even though conservation biology does both um, protect and uh, replenish. Restoration is more um, looking at replenishment. Got a big old question mark for this. 
Not an X. I'm not quite sure if I'm going to ask you about that on the exam. But are there any questions about conservation biology or restoration ecology before we move forward and actually talk about these in a little bit more detail? Okay. So, does anybody know what that's a picture of? What's it like? You know, like, aren't they doing it, like, somewhere over there? Is it, what is it, Jefferson or whatever? Like, yeah, so yeah. The top of the mountain. Like, exactly. Like, like, yeah. you know? It's coal mining, mount top and move, right? So restoration ecology would be the kind of science that doesn't just say, don't do coal mining, right? It's beyond that, because we do coal mining. So people doing restoration ecology, for example, would say, all right, how are we going to restore that? Because it's not, as we know, now that we've gone through this course, we know that um, ecosystems are a little bit more complicated than you would think. So it's not like you just go out there and put a bunch of any old soil and then just throw a bunch of grass seeds and say, okay, it'll turn back to normal, right? No, you need to know exactly how to, how to do it. That's what restoration ecology is. Anyway, before we talk about those things specifically, there's some other stuff you need to know. The first word you need to know is biodiversity hotspot. I'm pretty sure this question will be on the exam. Um, before we talk about exactly what it is, again, I give you a little introduction that your book gives. Conservation biologists are applying the understanding of population, commun population, community, and ecosystem dynamics in establishing parks, wilderness areas, and other legally protected nature reserves. Here's a picture of Cranberry Glades uh, sign, just because that's one of the local um, wilderness areas that is legally protected. But that's not important for the exam, that's just an introduction to what we're about to talk about, which is this. Conservation often focuses on something called biodiversity hotspots. And you need to know what a biodiversity hotspot is. First of all, it's a relatively small area. That's the least important part. The more important part, more part, uh, more important part is that there are a large number of endangered or threatened species. The other very important part is that there's a high concentration of endemic species. What is an endemic species? That is a species found nowhere else, which makes sense, right? You know, if you're talking about like cutting down, you know, 10 acres in the Kanawha State Forest to get timber, it's probably not that big of a deal because you're probably cutting down oaks and maybe some sycamores, some maples, things like that. I mean, I'm not a fan of cutting down trees for no reason, but those aren't endemic species, right? So endemic species are obviously more important because if you kill that little population, you're done because there are no other populations, right? They're found nowhere else, which is a good uh, topic for independent work. What are some endemic species? I wouldn't say found in West Virginia because West Virginia is a very, how do I put that? It's the, the state of West Virginia, the, you know, the, the borders that define West Virginia, that's all arbitrary and political, right? So if you're going to look up endemic species for this area, I would say look up endemic species of Appalachia. But maybe West Virginia. There might be some endemic species that, that are found in no other state. But anyway, you can look it up for independent work if you want. Anyway, on the next slide, I'm going to show you some of the hottest of the biodiversity hotspots. I'm going to put an X through it because I'm definitely not going to ask you this, but you can see where a lot of the hotspots are. And before I had this course, it was it's really hard to see. There. Those of you online can see it perfectly. But what we're looking at here, well, yeah, you can, you can kind of see it, right? So there's South America, there's North America, there's Africa, there's Europe, Asia, Australia. You can see there's a lot of hot spots in those, uh, the islands between Australia and Asia. Anyway, are there any questions so far? All right, let's talk. Oh, man, maybe we can finish this. Let's talk about conservation at the ecosystem level. Conservation biology aims at sustaining the biodiversity. As we already know, there's no need to write, well, you already know, we're talking about communities and ecosystems, right? So we're looking at the communities, we're looking at ecosystems. We want a lot of species there. We want things to be natural, right? We're looking at sustaining the biodiversity. A term that I haven't given you yet are, is landscapes. You need to know what a landscape is. It's a regional assemblage of interacting ecosystems such as an area with a forest, with adjacent fields, wetlands, streams, streams, I have that. So I put this right here. And everything past that is just an example. It's a regional assemblage of interacting ecosystems. So again, think about looking at small and building your way up, right? It's a great time to remind you this for the this is a good review for the exam. A population, 
It's just a bunch of organisms of the same species in the same area at the same time that are acting with each other, right? That's a population. A step up from that, like the squirrels at the BSU campus. A step up from that would be a community. So now you're not just looking at the, the, the squirrels, you're looking at all the living things in that area. The oak trees on WBSU campus, the feral cats, the humans, right? All the living things on WBSU's campus. Then you take it a next step, an ecosystem. So again, now when we're talking about WBSU's campus, we're not just talking about all the living things, but we're talking about the way, you know, the sun hits the campus and how these buildings call shadows. So on some sides, there's a lot of sun. On other sides, there's a lot of shade, and that's going to dictate which plants grow there, which is going to dictate which herbivores live there, which is going to dictate which things that eat those herbivores live there, so on and so forth. That's an ecosystem. We've all talked about that. The new information is just one more step up. Now we're talking about landscapes. So now we're not just talking about one ecosystem, but a bunch of ecosystems. Right? So right across I-64 is a forest ecosystem. Right here is a suburban ecosystem. Right Behind us is a river ecosystem. And then between us and the river ecosystem is what's called a riparian ecosystem. I bet you need to know that. But that, that area where rivers meet land, that's a specific ecosystem. There's different creatures that live there than that live on land or in the water. So anyway, now that you know what a landscape is, we'll talk about landscape ecology. Landscape ecology um, is the application of ecological principles to study, uh, to the study and uh, uh, land use patterns. And the goal is to make conservation a functional part of planning for land use. So basically, in my opinion, I don't know enough about this to give you a good opinion because I haven't looked into it enough, but where they just filled in those wetlands in South Charleston, you know, right off the exit, I think that's a bad thing. So that was a wetland. That was a whole different uh, ecosystem. And that just completely got rid of that ecosystem, which changes the landscape of this area. Right? That's one ecosystem that's completely destroyed now, or changed, I guess you could say. Um, so earlier I mentioned, you know, right behind WBSU's campus is a river, and then we're obviously a terrestrial ecosystem. Right there in the middle is a unique ecosystem, and that's what this slide talks about. Edges between ecosystems. They are prominent features of landscapes, whether they're natural or altered by people, and they have their own physical conditions, such as soil type and surface area, blah, blah, blah. They're unique. So again, I asked this question uh, earlier this week. I said, how many of you have ever been walking through the woods? A lot of you raise your hands. And you notice like when you're in the woods, it's easy to walk through the woods. There's trees, but there's not a lot of bushes and vines and thorns, right? Because you're covered by the canopy. But then once you get to the edge of the woods, it's a little bit harder to get in because there's bushes growing and vines, right? Because that's where it's a unique ecosystem. It's right there at the border. That's just one example. Here's a picture that shows you what we're talking about. So there's a river, right? That river is an aquatic ecosystem. Um, that grassland is a, is a terrestrial ecosystem. Those are two unique ecosystems. And then what you can't see is right there at that border, that's its own ecosystem, right? The border of river and grassland. That is going to be its own unique ecosystem. And same here, right? So that's a natural version of it. This was created by humans, but there's still going to be that, you know, again, right here at the border between the forest and the grassland, that's a unique ecosystem in that little strip. There's going to be plants growing right here that are not growing right here. Let me do it so that people on, online can see it. There's going to be plants growing right here, right in that border, that are not growing here, and that are not growing here. And of course, I'm just using plants as an example. Also, there's all many things that are going to be different. Anyway, any questions about that? All right, the next thing your book, I have to move quickly. The next thing your book talks about is something called the movement corridor. That is an narrow strip of or series of small clumps of habitat that connect otherwise isolated patches. So let me back up really quickly and I'll come back to the side. But like this would be a movement corridor, right? So here we have a forest, there we have a forest, in between we have grassland or urban area, but there's movement corridors, right? There's ways for things that live in this in the, the, the forest to get from this clump to this clump. Right? You could go through that, or you could go through there. That's what a movement corridor is. Um, why is it important? It can help promote dispersal, which again is moving things around, moving things from one place to the next. That itself can help sustain populations. Um, and that is important to species that migrate between different habitats. So like when we talked about um, that woodpecker earlier, it can't just go from one place to the, the next. It needs uh, specific conditions. Um, 
However, sometimes it can be bad. Movement corridors can spread disease, especially among small subpopulations in closely situated habitat patches. I'll put an X to this part. You really don't need to know that for the exam. Um, there is a question on the study guide that I'll talk to you about if you want in person, but that won't be on the uh, won't be on the exam. Speaking of which, for office hours today, I plan to meet with somebody, and we're going to discuss the exam. We're basically having an exam review. I'm going to record it and share it with you guys, but you're welcome to join us at 9 a.m. We're going to go over, I think, exams one, exam two, exam three, and then uh, study guide 13. 19 to 20. Would that count for our 5% extra credit or not? Not that one. It will for her. Okay. I'm specifically meeting her. Gotcha. You can join us. Gotcha. And you can sit through that and learn, and then I can yeah. go through you. The only reason gotcha. why is because, yeah, I'll be covering her exams. Um, yeah. So, anyway, there's a, uh, an example of a movement corridor that helps nature get across you know, a busy highway, right? That's helpful. Isn't yeah. that so that I could have gone to the road and like, Bye. Yeah, that's one of the reasons. Yeah, you know, yeah, you don't want like, for example, a deer getting hit. And then there's another example, right? So you can see what you can't see here is a big forest land, but now we have this way for animals to get from the big forest land to that big forest land. And humans just think just walk across the field because that's what humans do, right? But for other animals, you know, sometimes it's not that easy. Sometimes they need those movement corridors. One minute left. Rest restoring uh, really quickly. You need to know what bioremediation is. That's basically like, all right, you've got a mess from pollutants. How do you fix it up? You fix it up with living things, right? So, well, that's one of the ways. So, you can see people picking up litter or like cleaning oil off of stuff. That's one way of cleaning things. Another way of cleaning things is called bioremediation. And again, that's when you're using living things to pick up or to fix pollution. And then you can read the examples. I probably won't ask you questions about it on the exam. And that's 8.50, so we'll actually just finish there. Uh, the last word for attendance then will be spring. You know, the spring semester will be the next time. Hopefully, hopefully I don't have to see you. Hopefully you don't have to see me again in this context. So spring is the last word for attendance. I'm going to take a picture for Oh, yeah, yeah, let's take pictures. Do you mind taking a picture for us? Me? Sure. Yeah, I bought a red t-shirt just for this one.